Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Christopher Lidke, and I study philosophy and economics here at UNC Asheville. Today, it is my distinct honor to welcome our distinguished guest speaker. But first, I would like to thank the Osher Lifetime Learning Center, as well as the Uni University of North Carolina Asheville's Economic Club for making this event possible. Dr. Jonathan Morduck is currently the Professor of Public Policy and Economics at New York University's Wagner Graduate School of Public Service, as well as the Executive Director of the Financial um, Access Initiative. Dr. Morduck's work focuses on microfinance, social investment, as well as um, developmental economics. He's the co-author of such works as uh, development, I'm sorry, uh, Portfolios of the Poor, how the world's poor live on $2 a day, the economics of microfinance, and numerous other scholarly articles. Please enjoy this talk on how the world's poor live on $2 a day. A short question and answer period will be held at the end, and when you do line up behind the microphones, please be sure to speak directly into the microphone as this talk is being recorded. Please enjoy this talk, uh, and please enjoy Dr. Morduck's speak about what makes my microfinance work for the poor later tonight at 6 p.m. in this room. Now, without further ado, please join me in giving a warm bulldog welcome to Dr. Jonathan Morduck. Thanks, Chris. Thank you, Chris, for that welcome. It's really a great pleasure to be here. I want to thank um, the Osher Center and the UNC uh, Economics Club for hosting this event, and I want to thank all of you um, for coming and spending some time thinking about some of the most um, challenging issues that we have facing us. Um, I want to talk about a set of ideas that I've been thinking about with colleagues for um, a number of years now, and I want to share some ideas about how we might move forward. It's exciting and appropriate that today we're meeting a day after Martin Luther King Day, and Dr. King we know and honor for his work on racial um, inequality and for pushing us forward to think harder about members of the community who have been excluded for um, historical reasons. I think it's at the end of Dr. King's life and um, you know, as we've followed forward in the last few decades, we've increasingly been thinking broadly about inequalities and thinking about economic inequalities and financial inequalities and broader sets of inequalities um, that are faced by members of our communities. And that's really the spirit of what I want to share today, to think about economic inequalities and how it is that so many people on our planet live on so little and what we might be able to do to help and what we might be able to do, more importantly, to help them help themselves. So this work today is a collaborative effort with three really amazing uh, researchers. This, I want to talk about a book called Portfolios of the Poor, as Chris mentioned, that was co-written with Stuart Rutherford, who is not only a, one of the sort of sharpest thinkers about poverty and inequality that I know, um, he's based in Nagoya, Japan, but he's also spent much of his life in um, Dhaka, Bangladesh, and he is not only a thinker and writer, but he also runs a microfinance institution. He created it and runs it in the slums of Dhaka, putting ideas into practice and trying to make a difference in the lives of the community. I'm going to share some of the stories of some of the people that Stuart got to know. The work's also um, collaborated with Daryl Collins, who's now in Boston, but who spent many years um, in South Africa, and we're going to share some of the stories about some of the people she got to know in the townships um, in South Africa, and collaborative work with Orlando Ruthven, who's based in Delhi, India, and who worked in the slums um, there. This book and this, um, this conversation is really about a problem um, that we think about a lot at some level, or scholars and economists think about a lot, but which at many levels is hard to get a hold of on. The problem is that around the world, and this is data from the World Bank, if we count up how many people are living on what is called sort of global poverty line, which the World Bank 
establishes that $2 a day per person or $1 a day per person? If we look around the world at the data, we count up about 2.5 billion people living on $2 a day or less. Now that number's come down a little bit over time, but it's roughly stayed that way for the last couple of decades. Two and a half billion people on the planet living on under $2 a day. That's, if we put it a different way, about 43% of the planet. That, to so many of us, is a number that's kind of both amazingly huge, that so many people who live on this planet with us uh, are living on so little, and so small, so huge in magnitude, but so small in that $2 a day, $1 a day, about a billion people here living on about a dollar a day. That, that number is so small, $2 a day, that it's very hard to imagine what it must be like. It's very hard for us here in Asheville, very hard for us living in the United States, to imagine what it's like for so many people on the planet to actually get by on $2 a day, to live their lives, to keep their kids in school, to get food on the table, to maybe start a small business, keep generate a little bit of income. How do they do it? And that question is so difficult, so challenging, so remote from our daily experience that we make assumptions. And sometimes those assumptions are reasonable. But what I want to suggest today, what I want to share today, is a set of experiences which show that the assumptions we often make are wrong, and wrong in ways that keep us from seeing some solutions to one of the biggest problems that we as a global community face. So that's what I want to share today by letting you in on some of the stories, some of the experiences of a group of families that we got to know over a year who day in and day out actually lived the experience of trying to get by on $2 a day. And that $2, as we know, as I say, is you know, for us just such a pittance. Right? Can't even buy a coffee. But for others, if you're, if you're you know, living in that kind of poverty, um, that's what you have to get by on. And so it's easy, the kind of assumptions that we make, it's easy for us to assume that if you live on so little, you're probably living hand to mouth. Right? You're probably not thinking about the future. You're probably not able to save. You're just trying to meet your most immediate needs as quickly as you can, trying to just get some basic shelter, some basic food, some basic nutrition, take care of some basic health care, and not really able to think about building a better future. Those are the kind of assumptions that we make about the families that are living in those conditions. And what I want to suggest is that those assumptions are totally reasonable, but they are wrong much of the time and keep us from seeing an important part of the condition of poverty. Now this is about global poverty and the global poverty problem, but it's not that the conditions of poverty in the United States are less important, um, but they're different. So I want to focus on the global poverty problem and at the end I have a few thoughts on a related project that's focusing on communities here in the United States. So we'll get there at the end, but for the next 20 minutes, I want to share a little bit about some of the families we got to know. The way that we got to know them as a research project was through a process called financial diaries. Now these aren't diaries in the way that you typically think of diaries. These aren't um, ledgers that, you would, that we ask the families to fill in. In fact, most of the families we got to know are illiterate and many are innumerate. But instead, they capture the spirit of a diary in the way that when you keep a diary, right, we keep our, our daily thoughts, our intimate um, feelings, our a catalog of our experiences, and we often share things that with our diary that it's hard for others to see, hard for outsiders to see. And that's really what we're trying to do with the financial diaries. The financial diaries are surveys that collect information on households, and the households that we're going to be um, focusing on are in India, Bangladesh, and South Africa, they are surveys that collect ev data on every penny that those households earned and every penny that those households spent. This is a very 
intimate financial view of how those households manage their money and how they got by. So the places that we're looking at um, vary in their condition and the experience. So here's a picture from um, South Africa. This is um, a family living in the townships in South Africa, so a more urban existence. This is a woman in rural Bangladesh, one of the families that Stuart Rutherford got to know, um, who are living off the land. And here's a family um, in the slums of Dhaka who are living in a, um, a concrete shelter, but in that single room. I want to tell you a little bit about some of these families and how they get by. Now this process, just to step back, I know many of you are economics um, major, so I want to give you a little sense of how this survey fits into the bigger scheme of things. Really, our view was to try to find a way of collecting data that was different from how economists usually collect data. So the way that I was taught to um, collect data and to analyze data was to collect big data sets, um, large one-time surveys, and that's usually what we use for economic analysis. Right? The United States government collects lots of large data sets, as do governments around the world, as does the World Bank and the United Nations, and those are incredibly valuable for getting a sense of how a population is existing at any one time. On the other um, side of the scale, there are social scientists, anthropologists, who collect very detailed data, um, which is ethnographic, which is really telling the story of communities. Very narrative, very rich, um, but not very structured in the way that economists um, are used to. And so what we're trying to do is find a middle ground. So it's small scale. It's high frequency, so not just going one time and collecting survey data, but going back to the households again and again, getting to know them. In fact, the households were met every couple weeks. We sort of step by, day by day, um, how they're living. We want to collect quantitative data, but also want to hear their stories. And so what you're going to be hearing is qualitative information. So in that sense, borrowing some tools from anthropologists. And, and this may seem odd, but it turned out to be extremely powerful, we used the tools of corporate finance to put some structure on the data we were getting. So if you're in business, you know that when you're running a business, you've got balance sheets, you've got income statements, you've got cash flow statements. Well, we constructed the equivalent of those for every household. Right? So every dollar, every penny that was going in and out, we ran through a very structured set of um, income statements in order to see the full picture and make sure um, we had the data in an organized way. So this is kind of like an economist trying to learn from anthropologists, but also thinking through the lens of um, a business person. It turned out to be a pretty powerful way of um, looking at the world, and it turned out to um, give us some insights that were pretty surprising. So the first thing, and this was very humbling, was just in terms of what we got to see through this method. So let me give you um, one graph, and this comes from the work that Daryl Collins did in South Africa. So this graph here is going to be based on a basic accounting equation. So a bunch of you have probably done accounting or are familiar with the basics of accounting. And one of the basics is that you know, funds that are going in have to equal funds that are going out, or else you're really in trouble. And it's the same for every family, right? You've got sources of funds and you've got uses of funds. So those should be equal. You've got your income and you've got your expenditures, and they should be roughly equal. Right? If not, you're borrowing or, or saving, but that ought to be accounted for. And so if, you're not, if your data is not lining up, you've got some margin of error. So here's the, um, the graph that was humbling to us. This is a graph of the margin of error that I was just describing, where we couldn't line up the um, inflows and outflows. And here's the, um, a line that captures the margin of error. What that line says is that margin of error was huge. The black line that goes across is zero. That's if we had it exactly right. It took us about six interviews. That's meeting with a family for about three months before that margin of error got to within, within 6%. So for three months, we really were struggling collecting data, spending time with families. And this here was mostly Daryl Collins' research team. Spending time with families, but we were way off in terms of really seeing what their economic life was like. Because it's really hard to see. Because a lot of the transactions go through the informal sector. 
because households' lives are complicated. Because just like the rest of us, the households are reluctant to share private information. If I asked you guys how much you have in your savings account right now, you probably think twice before just give me an answer. And households around the world are like that. But as trust was built up, as we got to know them, as they understood what the research process was like, as conversations unfolded, we got a richer story. And by the end of it, we were able to feel that we really got a handle on what was going on. So there were two implications. So the first implication is we just had much better data, much more accurate data on things that economists usually look at. But the more important implication was that we were able to see all kinds of activities that have been hidden, all kinds of um, strategies and um, various activities that economists usually don't see and that because they don't see them allow them to sort of maintain assumptions which turn out not to be right. And I want to show you some of what I mean and how that changed our views. Okay. So let's turn to some of the, um, one of the lessons. And one of the big lessons, and this was, as I was saying, very humbling for me, is that those big one-time surveys that I was so used to using in my career and analyzing in my professional work, those one-time surveys are missing a lot. That was one of the big lessons. But I want to turn to some of the lessons that are more fundamental about the lives of the poor. The first one really jumped out in the data. The households that we got to know were all really actively working to patch together financial and economic lives. So we had this idea originally that there couldn't really be much going on because their lives had to be so simple. They're living on so little, a lot of them living on under $1 a day, that in fact it's um, unlikely that they were doing much in the way of money management or having much to do with financial lives at all. So first lesson was that wasn't right. The poor were very actively managing their money using informal mechanisms, just with friends and neighbors, microfinance, which is somewhere in between that, a little bit more formalized, and also some of them were using banks. Okay. The, um, an example, and this really, uh, really uh, sort of put it very finely, in Orlando Ruthven's sample in India, she found, for example, that every two weeks on average, households were starting some new kind of financial arrangement. They might be borrowing from a money lender or asking a money guard to hold some money. That's just a friend you might ask to hold some money. We call it a money guard. They might be starting a savings club. They might be going to a bank and trying to get a loan or um, create a savings deposit. They were doing one of those activities on average every two weeks. So we'd gone, on, gone in wondering if there would be much in the way of financial activity. We were seeing a lot, and probably a lot more than, in fact, most of us in this room are engaged in. We usually just have a bank account or a credit card, and we just use them, or a debit card, and we just use them. Here instead, families were very actively creating, maintaining, expanding their financial lives. Second thing that really struck us, these families are very poor. They're among the poorest living on the planet. Their incomes are very low on average. And yet, the flow of money that was going through these different financial devices and activities that they'd created were very big. On average, in Bangladesh, for example, the households were pulling or pushing, sort of putting in or taking out of these devices a sum equal to two-thirds of their annual cash income. What that means is this idea that if you're, you're living on so little, that you must be living hand to mouth. You must be taking that money as soon as you get it and just using it to purchase food. That that idea just doesn't come through in our data. In fact, a lot of that money is being held for the future. It's being saved, it's being um, held because the households are poor and because they need to think about the difficulties that might lie ahead. So that was one of the, the biggest revelations, that households were maintaining active financial lives. They were doing all of these things, not despite being poor, 
but because they were poor. We'd really got it backwards. And so this was the starting point. We saw small incomes, but very large flows, very, a lot of activity. A third of the households were using more than 10 different kinds of financial mechanisms to create a financial life. For them, finance really mattered, and that was important to see. So let me tell you about um, a family in the slums of Dhaka. Dhaka is the capital of Bangladesh. Bangladesh, as you know, is um, in South Asia, borders um, India, one of the poorer countries in the world, and Dhaka is the capital, and the slums of Dhaka are one of the poorest areas um, in that country. This is uh, Hamid. Now, Hamid's a, a taxi driver, drives that rickshaw. He's not, it's not a great job, he's actually a backup driver. So he only gets to drive the taxi when, he, um, when the regular driver needs a day off. So his life's pretty uncertain because he's not sure when he's going to get to drive it. He doesn't get to drive it all the time. And on the days he gets to drive it, it's not clear how much traffic he'll get. It turns out that when we spent time with Hamid and his, um, his wife and son, that we could calculate his income as just about $2 a day. And this is the calculation there. But we do the calculation to convert the $2 a day into units that are comparable to U.S. purchasing power. It's called purchasing power parity. And some of you are familiar with that, PPP. So this is $2 a day PPP adjusted. Okay. So Hamid is an, was an interesting um, young man, very ambitious. He'd been born on the coast of Bangladesh, moved to Dhaka to find his fortune, and ended up in the slum. This is a picture of his house. He lives in this one room with his wife, Kadija, who lives on the, who, sorry, who's sitting on the um, bed there, and their son um, just to his right. Around him are other members um, of the community who are living um, nearby who just came in to check out the activity. They live in this um, house in the slum. It's not bad in that it's got um, concrete walls, but they share this facility, they share this space um, with six other families, they share a kitchen, they share a toilet together. So they live entirely, this family lives entirely in this room. If we'd gone to Hamid and Khadija and we had said, you know, tell us about your economic life, tell us about your financial life, we would have learned a little bit and we probably would have heard about these kinds of things. Khadija has a microfinance loan. They have a little microfinance savings account that comes with that. And they had a little bit of life insurance because an agent was coming around the um, slum door to door and sold it to them and they were paying on that for a while. But what we wouldn't have seen, but which we did get to see through the financial diaries approach, was that in fact they had a much richer set of activities that made up their financial life. They were borrowing from a neighbor without interest. They were borrowing from their uh, sh shopkeeper um, when they were running low on cash. They were taking money from their activities and they were sending it back home to um, store back there as kind of a, a savings. They were saving a little bit at home, they were just hiding it under their bed. They had a little bit of cash. They were saving with a money guard, which is, as I said, they were asking a friend to hold some money for them. They were actually making loans to other people in the community. They were sometimes going to the employer, Hamid's employer, and getting a wage advance, which is kind of a loan. And they were um, behind on the rent, which was also a financial strategy. Um, it was essentially a loan. So they were doing a lot of things, some involving saving, some involving borrowing. And in fact, when we got to know them and we put it all together, we saw that a bunch of these activities were actually savings activities. So Haman and Khadija showed us that another of our assumptions was just wrong. We had assumed that poor families wouldn't have much of a financial life. That turned out to be wrong very actively maintaining a financial life. And we'd assume that poor households couldn't save, that they'd be living hand to mouth. We saw that wasn't right. And here we see that there's a lot of saving that happens. It just happens in ways that we don't usually see. And that started to change the way we thought about poverty and the way that we um, thought about opportunities for these families. And we put together those ideas and this is the idea really at the heart of this study. We put together those ideas to create an, a notion that we call the triple whammy. 
that the condition of poverty in the world today is characterized by three elements. And the first one is the familiar one, that households have low incomes. On average, low incomes. But there was a second element, which is really critical, which is that those incomes are irregular and unpredictable. Hamid's income went up and down because he would never know when he'd get that tax. He would never know how much he'd earn. It was that unpredictability and irregularity which drove so much of his life, which meant they had to save, which meant they had to put things together because they never knew what the future would be like. That changed the story in an important way. And the third element of this vision is the lack of appropriate financial tools. Lack of the kind of tools that we all take for granted, right? To borrow a little bit when you need some, to be able to save reliably and conveniently, that was all very hard. And so what we saw was households scrambling, often very creatively, to put something together that could approximate a workable financial life. And we started to think, well, if we could only help them do better, their lives could come together more successfully. I want to talk about those ups and downs because they turned out to be really critical. And I'll give a few examples um, and then turn to some of the solutions. So ups and downs. An obvious example of ups and downs in the lives of the poor would be seasonality. Right? So if you're a farmer, you obviously have some seasons, harvest seasons, where you're making a lot of money, and then seasons um, where you're not. And this is an example from rural India that um, comes from Orlando Ruthven's sample where you can see they've got small farmers and the local traders who are trading in agricultural goods. They do well during peak seasons, and those are the spikes to the right happening in April, May, June. But their job, and this is what we often forget, is to figure out how to take that money that they earn then and make it spread out through August and September and October, November, up until the peak season comes again. We lose sight of that, that $2 a day it's low enough as it is, but it's just an average, and there's important seasonal variations. And that reshapes how we think about poverty. But it's not just a rural phenomenon. This is also a challenge in urban areas. This is a woman in Pumza in South Africa. Now, Pumza earns um, her income two ways. One, she gets a pension from the state. She's um, of retirement age. She gets a small... Um, pension that comes about $100 a month. And she also has a little um, stand on the side of the road where she sells snack foods. You can see her there um, cooking up some snack foods that she sells to passersby. And she's got a friend on the other side of the road who's doing exactly the same thing and they talk to each other all day long and that's um, how Pomza makes her money. So because we're economists and sort of financially minded, we then tracked how that business went. And these are the net cash flows of Pumsa's business week by week. What you can see is they're going up and down a lot. So it's not just the farmers in rural areas who are facing lots of ups and downs. It's people like Pumsa as well. Sometimes some days, some weeks are much better than others. There's some cyclicality. And if Pumsa earned that average, that yellow line there, if, if Pumsa actually had a steady income, her life would be very different. As it turned out, those ups and downs really shaped Pumsa life. When Pumsa hit those bottoms, she ended up having to borrow from a money lender or borrow from a, um, a finance institution at 20% to 30% interest rates per month to deal with those um, downturns. So if you think your credit cards are expensive, try 20 to 30 percent per month. And that's what Pumza had to turn to because of those ups and downs. So those ups and downs really became a core to our understanding of the conditions of poverty. The challenge of living on two dollars a day is that two dollars a day is just an average. If there's one thing, one idea I want to leave you with, it's really that idea. Now I want to talk a little bit about savings. I argue, and what we saw was that households really want to save because they're thinking about the future. They want to be able to put some money away. But it's hard. It's hard for all of us. You can imagine if you're living on $2 a day, it's especially hard. And what's interesting is the, the families that were living on $2 a day were saving, 
but they were doing it in particular ways that made a lot of sense and that we can learn from. So I, I want to share a little bit um, about a woman named Nomsa in South Africa. So Nomsa helped to see that the poor can and do save. They want to save, they can save, they do save, but they often do it in very small amounts that over time add up. What's interesting about Nomsa, and I'll, I'll show you her solution in a second, she has a bank account. In fact, in Africa, most of the older people in our um, sample have bank, bank accounts because they get pensions and the pensions come into bank accounts, but it's not where they save. The formal sector isn't convenient enough, it doesn't, isn't quite flexible enough, um, and so they look to the informal sector. That's not perfect either because it's often unreliable. So, but I'll show you what Nomsa did. Now, Nomsa is an older woman. She's 77 years old. She's looking after her grandchildren because her two daughters died of AIDS. So she knows that she's got to save up at the end of the year to buy clothing for them, buy books, buy, um, pay for school fees. She knows that she's got a lot of expenditures coming at the end of the year. So she gets together with her friends, and they formed a savings club. And we see this in every place we've looked, this kind of thing. They created a savings club and they all agreed that every month, out of the little that they were earning, they would put aside $9. Put aside $9 every month. They actually put it under the bed of one of them. And at the end of the year, they would each have 11 months worth, so $99. And that was one way that Nomsa saved. So looking after her grandchildren, she created a savings club like this. She had two other savings clubs which were similar, and all together she was able to save about 25% um, of her income. So savings really matters, but households do them in particular ways. So why'd they do it like this? Well, you know, why didn't Nomsa just put her own money under her own mattress rather than creating a savings club? When we asked Nomsa and we asked her friends, the answer was pretty simple. If I don't put in my money every month, I feel like I'm letting my friends down. So they know how difficult it is and they create a group to um, create social support and some structure. And that is something we see again and again. People want to save, but they're looking for support and looking for some discipline. And then with that, they can do lots of great things. The question that I want to get to is whether we can think about or whether banks can think about or other institutions can think about ways to make this even better for poorer households. Last thing I want to touch on um, before turning to solutions is risk. This is a, um, a photograph of a fire that swept through the local market um, in this area outside Cape Town that um, Daryl Collins got to, um, was working in. Risk like this happens again and again in the kind of communities we see, much more so um, than in our communities. There's just less protection. We're seeing fire and loss, for example, about 19% of diary households are facing um, broad loss in their communities. Often the government would just declare that the slum would be cleared and they would come in with bulldozers and just start removing shacks and markets. Um, illness, also a big issue. These are not very, um, healthy communities. About half the families we got to know in Bangladesh, about 42% in India, suffering major illness. And in South Africa, where AIDS has been such a problem, paying for funerals turns out to be a major drain um, for the households. And about 81% um, during the year were responsible um, for paying for funerals, which was uh, a big source of stress. When these major events happen, and families don't have a lot of great um, mechanisms to fall back on, so we see they're selling assets, they're taking on high interest loans, or they're exhausting their savings. So dealing with risk is, a, is by itself a really important factor in the lives of poor households, and it can often mean that, they're, that the families are set back in a way that um, keep them from moving forward. So we can find, how, let households have a better way to deal with risk can keep them from falling into traps. And that means helping them find financing to put together the right money at the right moment. So here's an example. This is an example um, of a man named Faisal. 
lived in, lives in rural India, makes his money by selling aluminum pots. He's a, um, a pot salesman. So he puts that basket of pots on the back of his bicycle, straps it on, and he goes around on his bicycle from village to village selling pots. It's a reasonable way to make income in the community, and he earns about $36 a month, and he supports a family with that money. But during the study year, Faisal um, had an accident and fell off his bike, fractured his thigh, broke his leg. He had no insurance, of course, because there is no health insurance, um, at least available then. And so what Faisal did was, you know, first went to the local uh, healer and really couldn't get any treatment that way, and so ended up doing anything serious that would help his problem. For eight months, he couldn't work. For eight months, he lost wages, and he's the sole supporter of his family. In the end, his father got involved and pulled together the community to bring together a sum that's relatively small, at least for us, um, $250 that got Faisal to the hospital, could help him fix his leg, and get him back on his bicycle and help him support his family again. But that involved a number of activities. They had to borrow, they had to draw down their savings, they had to go to their son's employer and get some money that way, and also tap relatives um, and the generosity and kindness of the family. And so we see that again and again, it's not just regular ups and downs, but also these risks um, that turn out to derail families. So, what are we learning? Well, we learned a lot that changed how we thought about things. Poor families we got to know are active financial managers. They're actively managing their money. We saw that being poor isn't just about having low incomes, but about dealing with the, sw dealing with the swings of income around their average. We saw people want to save, they can save, they do save. They just don't have great ways to do it. And we saw that people face a lot of risks, but they don't have great financial tools. And we think a lot about health problems in the developing world and poor communities. We don't think often enough about how the f those health problems are connected to financial problems, and solving financial problems is often the way to solve the health problems. That these things are very closely linked. So those are the lessons. So I want to take a few more minutes and set out some really interesting um, examples of ways to address these problems and do a little bit better. So here's a new vision. And that new vision is experimenting, learning, iterating, evaluating with new mechanisms that can help poor families do a better job of what they're trying to do now. So I'll give you an example. One big question is, when you see people not saving that much, is it because they don't want to or because they lack a really good way to save? Well, here's an example in the Philippines done by a colleague, Dean Carlin, um, and a group of his uh, collaborators, where to see if families actually might save a little bit better, they took the same idea that NOMSA had of getting people together creating some structure, and seeing if that would help people save. But instead of the way NOMSA did it, which was to take money and put it under a mattress, they actually worked with a commercial bank, and they offered a product to the customers of um, this particular bank in the Philippines, the Green Bank of Caraga. They created an account called the Seed Savings Account. Right? They had this great marketing and logo. And to open this account, you had to promise that you'd put in a certain amount of money at regular intervals, and you couldn't take it out until either you'd met a savings goal or else a certain amount of time had passed. So it was exactly like what NOMSA had created there in South Africa, but it was um, rule-bound and commercial. And here's what happened. So the researchers offered, with the cooperation of the bank, they offered this randomly to one group of customers but not to others. And then they wanted to see what would happen in the treatment group that got the account versus the control group. Right? So the offer was totally random. And it turned out that savings increased by about 85% for those who got access to this savings account. What they were looking for was some discipline and some structure just the way that NUMSA was. So here's the possibility of taking some of the ideas that we see in the financial diaries and turning them into real solutions 
that can make a difference. And that 85% increase um, is enough to buy you know, rice for the family for a month or um, goes a long way toward you know, paying for the doctor bill. It turns out that about a third of these clients were very actively using these accounts and the people who had demonstrated self-control problems were more, ac more likely to use them, which was as we expected. This kind of solution is not just in uh, the Philippines. Grameen Bank of Bangladesh, which is a well-known financial innovator, um, has done something similar. They're well-known as a bank that's found a way to lend money to poor households. Um, but it turns out that uh, early on, they, uh, about 10 years ago, they got into some uh, financial difficulties, the bank did, and they started rethinking what they were doing and they started um, creating savings accounts. Those savings accounts became so popular that now Grameen Bank takes more in in savings than it lends out uh, to its poor customers. These are customers that you know, 25 years ago, they're the leader of Grameen Bank at the time, Mohammed Yunus, the winner of the Nobel Peace Prize in 2006. He said these families wouldn't be able to save. But when Grameen rolled out a new set of savings accounts, which had discipline and structure, just like NUMS's account, just like the seed account, um, they turned out to be very popular and very effective. And so we're seeing now Grameen has turned into a savings institution. The very last thing um, I want to talk about is credit. And then we'll turn and um, take some questions. The one thing I want to say about credit is that one of the things we saw with the households was that they borrow a lot. They've got to borrow. It's just like us. We use credit cards a lot, right? Just to pay for you know, big ticket items that we can't pay, with the cash, can't pay for with the cash in our wallets. They borrow a lot, but they borrow for lots of different purposes. And we see the same thing here. The m global microfinance movement, which has sort of become the face of creating fin finance for poor families, has focused on one particular form of credit, which is giving credit to small-scale entrepreneurs to grow businesses. That's pretty valuable, but it turns out that when the families get the money, they say they're going to put the money into the business, but about half the time, they don't. So this is one of the um, things we learned from a second set of financial diaries called the Grameen II Diaries that Stuart Rutherford completed. And what he found, the bottom line, was that these kind of productive uses for loans, these business uses, which are the hallmark of microfinance, um, turned out to be concentrated among a minority of borrowers, that about half of the borrowers were using the loans for all sorts of purposes. And here's an example. Stuart got to know someone named Ramna, one of the customers from Grameen Bank. And he asked her, what are you doing with your loans? And um, he found out this is um, a reckoning of a particular feature of a loan called a top-up. This is what she did with it. First time she borrowed, she used it to buy some food. Then the monsoon season was coming. She needed to prepare for that, so she borrowed to buy um, grain for the coming season. The Next top up she used for funeral expenses and then she had to pay down an expensive money lender loan that was um, costing her a lot of money. Next time she bought more grain, she paid for medical treatment and finally she used the loan for school fees and for restocking food. The bottom line here is we're seeing people using lots of devices. Some saving devices, some credit devices, some insurance devices. What learning from these families taught us, what spending time in these communities taught us was that the way that we assume households approach their finances is often different from what they think is best for them. Even though the rhetoric of Grameen Bank is all about business loans, we can see that Ramna did some really smart things and really reasonable things with these loans. She's dealing with medical problems, she's buying food, she's keeping her family going. And so as we move forward, as we think about financial access, that's another important lesson to take on board. 
We see these similar kind of patterns in other places. Um, let me just skip right um, to the conclusion, which is that as we look broadly, as we get to know poor families, we've learned a lot, and we're continuing to learn. These financial diaries have now been um, developed and expanded around the world. They're going on in Mexico, they're going on in Africa, they're going on in Brazil, they're going on in different parts of the world. We're learning new things as we listen and we learn and we challenge our own assumptions. One of the most striking things we're learning is that there's a hidden tragedy of poverty. And that tragedy essentially is that the poor fa families we got to know often lack some simple tools to make the most of what they have. So it's hard enough to be poor but it's harder even to be poor without some basic tools to turn the resources that you do have into something better and to work toward a better future. So there's some great ideas out there. There's lots of innovation. They're being scaled up, they're being tested. But the beginning point is listening to families, understanding what they're doing, and taking on their priorities and their strategies as a key input into building out a better future. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. And now we're going to commence the uh, question and answer time. So please don't be shy. Come up to the microphone here in the center of the room and speak clearly into it. OK. I was just wondering, uh, you talked about how the financial diaries are very different from what has been traditionally used by economists to sort of measure these, these sort of financial activities by the poor. How did you come to the conclusion that these would work best? And what kind of gave you the idea? Yeah, that's a great question. I'm not sure that they are the perfect tool. But I think there was some frustration that we just weren't learning the right way um, from the tools that we ha did have. And it seemed like a pretty simple idea to just find a way to just listen in a more systematic way. So it combined the kind of rigor of you know, the traditional economic surveys with you know, kind of theoretically designed questionnaires with you know, what anthropologists were doing well. The idea actually, I have to give credit to a professor named David Hume at the University of Manchester in England. It was really his idea originally um, when he was talking to Stuart Rutherford in Bangladesh and said, you know, you guys should really be more systematic. You guys are out there all the time talking to poor families because Stuart Rutherford was running a microfinance institution. So they had customers and they were talking all the time. And it was David Hume's idea to be systematic about it, collect the data and see what they could learn. And the really great thing about it was, you know, often what we do is, because, you know, it might be involved in microfinance, so you talk to microfinance customers. But that means you're not talking to people who are not microfinance customers, who may have a lot more to say about microfinance and why it's not that useful, or, you know, what could be made better about it than the actual customers. And so one of the things which was nice about this method was we looked broadly at the community and talked to some of the better off folks, some of the poorest folks, um, and tried to put the stories together. Hi. Hi. Um, so you didn't get to talk about um, how this pertains to the U.S., but whenever I think of poverty, there's often, um, I guess, a, a bad attitude, if you will, like among those that don't have a lot of money. So I was wondering, as you got to know the families, what was their perspective on their financial situation? And did that affect how they viewed saving? And how might that come into play when we're talking about um, solutions here in the US? Because money's such, it's such a focus. You know, money will make you happy, this and that. You know, like, um, how did their perspective how was their right. perspective? Yeah. Thank you for raising that, and I'm glad I have a little chance to talk about it. Um, and I uh, just want to share that we are now in the middle of something we call the U.S. Financial Diaries. So we're now um, 
doing something very similar to what I just described, but in eastern Mississippi, in northern California, in southern Ohio, northern Kentucky, and in um, New York City. And tomorrow I'm going down to Georgia State where they're thinking about doing something similar in Atlanta. Um, but that's, they're just getting some ideas together around that. So we're just beginning this work, and I can't draw on that to um, make direct comparisons, but you know, clearly what we see in, on the global side is something quite similar to what we expect to be seeing here. You know, people, no matter what their culture or their attitudes, are dealing with some similar constraints, ups and downs, not having great access to um, you know, financial services. But the idea of saving, right, which I think is, was part of what you're getting at, right? culturally, um, the push to save, that idea, I think, I think is pretty broadly felt. The difference is less about saving and more about debt. That some communities just feel very uncomfortable taking on debt. Some households feel very uncomfortable taking on debt. And sometimes that's a great thing because then they don't get into trouble. And sometimes it's not a great thing because then they don't have the money they need to you know, buy the things they need or um, deal with some of the difficulties they're having. And so there isn't really a, a kind of magical formula in terms of the attitudes we see and the cultural um, differences we see. There's much more difference within the community in Bangladesh, say, or within the community in South Africa, within the community in, um, in India um, than across them. But clearly different households has, have different attitudes and um, we're going to see this, you know, expect to see the same as we progress in America. If I might, I have to go teach, so if I, if I don't stick around for your answer. The question I had from your talk is, is not how people deal with this, which I, th which I think most of the members of the audience would find to be rather remarkable. It's why so many people live on, on $2 or less a day. I mean, that to me is the question. You, you give sort of an economist perspective of how they do it and the kinds of relationships they have to develop. But to me, as someone who's in political science, who has a specialty in human rights, to me, the, the, the screeching question here is, how is it that in the year 2013, if I'm not mistaken, we still have 2.5 billion people? And in what, what could be done so that there aren't 2.5 billion? I mean, that to me is, is, is the more important question. And I wonder if you have some insight on that. That's a huge question, and one that even if you could stick around for a year and we could have a conversation, we wouldn't even begin to um, really get to the bottom of. But you know what we see in these communities is not only inequalities in financial access, but you know, low levels of education. So we're seeing innumeracy. Most of these families are um, can do basic math, but not a lot beyond that. Um, many are illiterate, and so basic lack of skills, basic lack of education, combined with serious health issues. And so, you know, that lack of human capital is one huge factor that we're seeing in these communities that are keeping them um, from being able to, to jump on to sort of the broader patterns of growth. But we are seeing improvements. I mean, you know, in India, the economy's growing. I mean, not as fast as they want to, but growing at six or seven percent. And with that, the families that we're seeing are going to eventually um, be pulled into that. In Bangladesh, we're seeing a pretty active uh, textile sector, for example, in Dhaka. Right? Families we're getting to know aren't necessarily going to be able to, um, you know, be able to jump onto that. But there will be ripples that extend more broadly. So the, the question is, how, what is it's keeping these kinds of families from being able to hook into these broader economic processes. And so human capital would be one. I think, you know, the financial access that really is a, a big focus of our book is another big one, and I don't think it's fully appreciated. Having financial access is what allows um, poor families to have the money they need to invest, to have some stability in their lives so they can hold on to jobs and be reliable um, employees. So I put human capital, financial access, and the, the final bit, 
as I said, this is a much longer conversation, um, is regulation and a broader environmental support. These are communities where regulations um, have kept, for a long time have kept, um, businesses from investing fully. And this is why all of these communities that we're getting to know are almost entirely in the informal sector. And it, within the informal sector, it's hard to put together the resources that are necessary to get to scale to really make um, bigger improvements. But like I say, a great question, a big question, um, but one that is hard to answer here. So I think we have time for one final question. In a lot of people, um, Econom economists, columnists, and public servants um, suggest that since the 90s that the phenom phenomenon of globalization um, and the interconnectedness of the global of local national economies is putting greater pressure on the poor to um, um, to essentially make or break it and that there's just and it's continuing the growing gap of the have the haves and the have nots but there are others who also claim that it's actually uplifting the poor in ways that we have never seen before in um, global history um, could you comment on that are we seeing one or the other or are we seeing a mix of the two is it subjective to local economies national economies etc cetera, etc cetera? it's a great question I, I think you know, we look at broad trends, globalization um, is definitely helping places like India, right? They're opening up their economies and we're seeing outsourcing and that's um, maybe not helping our communities here. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. But it's definitely providing new resources um, to economies there. And so globalization's helping, but it's helping some parts of those economies. People are generally better educated. People are more hooked in. and it's not necessarily helping the global poor to such a degree. They're often lacking the skills and often you know, not located in the places where they can so easily um, become part of that process. So the challenge as we look to globalization and, you know, and the pluses that can bring is finding better strategies to help more people take advantage of that and you know, as you're saying, there are also some minuses. It creates competition and some instability. And that points to the second part of um, you know, what we're really trying to do here is to put a focus on that kind of instability as well as an important part of um, the condition of poverty. The instability, the ups and downs, which are so hard to see, can be exacerbated by globalization, um, the economic uncertainties. And so globalization is just another reminder that we need to think about how poor families are working in an environment, trying to strategize and get ahead in an environment, um, which is often as, you know, as uncertain for them as it has become for many of us. And so it's a great question. We'll you know, continue to see how that plays out. So I think I should end here. I want to thank you very much for your time, your comments, your um, sharing your views, and it's really been a pleasure to be here in Nashville. Thank you. <laughs>